From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, fellow conspiracy realist, regardless of your political inclinations, your own personal beliefs or ideologies, one thing's for sure, Captain Planet was right. Uh, the world is burning down as we record. Good morning, by the way. And uh, we, <laughs> we hope that you are having at least a tolerable time while we watch civilization slide into a not quite inevitable catastrophe. Uh, today's story is one that's a long time in coming, both in terms of our show and in terms of the conspiracy and cover-up coming to light. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a true story. Uh, this is something that probably affects some of our fellow listeners to this day. Here are the facts. We're going to Niagara Falls. and We kind of have to explain Niagara Falls a little bit because it's super confusing if you're not from the U.S. It's a beautiful place, right? That's where Pam and uh, Pam and Jim got secretly married. Spoiler alert for the American office. Sorry. Yeah. In this case, we're going to Niagara Falls, New York. And right. uh, it's a it's a beautiful place. I'm looking at it on Google Maps right now, um, specifically looking at just all the the rivers and the giant lakes uh, that are that are roaming around there. The great ones. And when it freezes on rare occasions, that looks amazing. Uh, it is currently illegal to uh, put yourself in a barrel and go over the edge of one of those waterfalls for kicks. Uh, like in The Hobbit? The people scene. have done it. People have done it in real life. Uh, and some have survived. So <laughs> Niagara Falls, if you're not familiar with the area, it is the name for several things in this region. First, the beautiful falls. Uh, then secondly, two different cities, both with the same name, one in the States, one in Canada. And uh, then there's another place nearby, a smaller place that's just known as Niagara. You'll see it called the town of Niagara. What we're saying is they took the name Niagara and they just went nuts with it. <laughs> they were like, this works. Rinse and repeat. Uh, it's another a whole one. Thing. Another <laughs> one. Yes. DJ Khaled. So the, the U.S. city. Niagara Falls, the subject of today's show, is still, you know, due to its uh, location by the falls, it's still a pretty popular tourism destination. Uh, it has a fairly large population around a little north of 48,600 people. That's a fact that's going to be sadly important later because once upon a time, many, many more people lived there. I love that you're mentioning the map, Matt, because uh, if you Picture New York State, which is one of those very weirdly shaped states. Niagara is on the far, far northwestern corner, and it's been home to human beings for a long, long time because it's such a it's by such a great water source. And like we discussed earlier, that's usually one of the biggest, if not the biggest, determining factor for where civilizations begin. Yes, it is not just a coincidence that those places are called Niagara because of that Niagara River that connects up two major bodies of water. And uh, <laughs> the, I guess let's – should we talk about the exact place that we're going in this area? Why not? Specificity is, is the name of the game, guys. Yeah. If you are playing Cinema of the Mind with us today, folks, picture yourself like one of those investigators – on a procedural drama, you're looking at a at a satellite map and you go enhance. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the, the computer person is like, beep, 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 beep. So you're enhancing, you're zooming in to a neighborhood called Love Canal. That's his what? real name. Yeah, Love Canal. Fun. Let's, 
Let's get the sex jokes in early. Let's squeeze them in. Oh no, uh, no, we got we got a lot of show to squeeze those in. Uh, just you know, dear. organically, it's going to happen. When I hear Love Canal, though, yeah, of course, immediately you know, euphemism for uh, sexy parts. But also, uh, I picture like tunnel of love type situations where you you and your mm-hmm. sweetie, you know, are in a swan boat going through a tunnel um, with like you know cupids and stuff everywhere. I've, I've never actually seen one of those in the real world. I've only seen them in like movies. Have you guys ever seen a real tunnel of love at yeah. an amusement park? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Over time, a lot of them got replaced with like tunnel of spookiness kind yes. of vibes. Like spooky the love is the sp- how much spooky can you get? Then, yeah. yeah. Love is terrifying. Are you kidding? But the, uh, so there's a, uh, Matt, you and I were talking about this off air. Cast your memory back. It's 1890. There's a guy named William T. Love. Billy Love to his friends, as you said. Yep. He's a he's a railroad man. He's a forward thinker. And he says, I want to build a community to leverage hydroelectric power, which sounds very progressive nowadays, but 1890 was a very different time. And people didn't treat uh, stuff like hydroelectric energy as the so-called alternative energy sources. Ben, when you say a railroad man, do you mean like railroad tycoon uh, or like a railroad like he worked on the rails? He was a hobo. No, I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he was, no, no. Uh, yeah, let's learn a little bit. Uh, he was, you could call him an entrepreneur. I wouldn't put him in tycoon class. Got it. Uh, but he he was one of those Forward thinkers. If TED Talks were around at this time, he would have given a TED Talk on how to build a city. Uh, It would probably have been a great TED Talk, but the facts would have not been especially supportive of his ideas. He was he dreamed big is what we're saying. It's very American dream style. Well, he had a great idea. So you kind of have to it helps if you look at a map while we're talking about Mm -hmm. this. Maybe you should. If you imagine Lake Ontario and then. From there, the Niagara Falls kind of moving southward and kind of snaking around a bit. Billy Love's idea was to, instead of having to use the water that's already flowing down Niagara Falls in that main channel, was to connect up another part of the Niagara River that kind of goes around this thing called the Grand Island and uh, cut through the earth and make a new canal they would connect up to that lower part or that uh, the kind of channel of the river to Lake Ontario. And you would use that water flowing through to generate electricity is pretty brilliant. A great grand idea. Yeah. And it bypasses the falls. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like we're going to make our own thing uh, <laughs> with what's the Futurama joke with blackjack and hookers and uh, oh. hooker, hooker will come into play. Yeah, that's foreshadowing. So the. He calls this place Model City, New York, and his idea is ambitious, but it's also pretty brilliant because at the time, uh, one of the big problems with electricity, however generated, was uh, how to transmit it efficiently over long distances. So this is why hydroelectric stuff made sense. He thought, I will build this way to generate hydroelectric power and then industries are going to come to me. Manufacturers will build plants along the canal. And as work began on this in 1894, he's moving as quickly as he could, uh, there were manufacturers who had already kind of bought in, uh, investors who had put some money on the table for it. Other uh, other businesses are like sniffing around because it seems like a good deal. But they were beset poor Willie Loving Company, by a number of disasters. There's a thing called, there's a children's book called, uh, I can't remember the kid's name, but it's like the no good, very bad, terrible something day. Yeah, Alexander and the no good, terrible, very bad day. And he's just having a real bad day. Yeah, yeah. And and Love is having like an extended version of this uh, for a while. So first, there's a thing called the Panic of 1893. Economic disaster. Most investors are just trying to survive. They can't be part of this crazy future town. Uh, And then environmentalists come into play, and they'll appear a couple times in the story. In 1906, an early environmental group lobbies Congress to pass a law meant to protect the natural state of the Niagara River and the falls. 
And so they're successful in their lobbying. And Congress eventually bans the removal of water from the river, which means if you're a guy, any old guy who happens to be digging a canal powered by water coming from the river, you just sort of became a criminal if you keep doing. Yeah, but but hey, we can work around that. We're powerful. We can get more investors. These are not problems that we can't solve. But then guess what happens immediately after that? Another panic. This was <laughs> this time in 1907. <laughs> Yeah, uh, another economic panic. So uh, remaining investors who have still, you know, maybe they have sunk cost fallacy up to this point. Maybe they're like, okay, I'm just going to hold on and they have to let go. Around this time, too, in history, a uh, good friend of the show, Nikola Tesla, figures out how <laughs> to transmit electricity over long distances with alternating current. Uh, you can learn more about Tesla in our YouTube videos and earlier episodes. Learn about elephants and other animals being shocked, uh, sometimes to death. Uh, in a, a, if you in want a- to make electricity, you got to break a few elephants. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> or uh, hopefully you'll have to break a few Edison's. God, that guy's effect on history. Oh, anyhow, dang. anyhow. Yeah, this is bad. This is bad for our boy Willie Love. Uh, in 1910, the dream is dead. You know what I mean? It's like that song in Les Mis. And all that was left to commemorate his ambition is very like that poem, Ozymandias, Look Upon My Works, Ye Mighty. Uh, there's a partial ditch where he'd started digging the canal before all his dreams went to pot. Uh, it's but it's slowly, huge. It's huge. Don't imagine a little like ditch, you know, that you've seen on the side of the road. This thing yeah. is big. Yeah, it goes for city blocks. It It is, you know, it, it would have carried a significant amount of water. It is slowly filling with water over time. The seasons pass, snow, rain, sleet, hail, and locals start treating it like, the, like a watering hole, which is fine because it's big enough that it's not going to disappear, right? It's, uh, it's going to be a semi-permanent fixture for these folks. So if you're growing up, in the area at this time. You might swim there in the summer. If we go back with the idea of dating, you might get some skates and uh, and take your honey out there when the water freezes. So it's just now it's like a local attraction and the city authorities quietly for about 10, 15 years, they've been thinking of ways to better use this land. A skate park is fine. A uh, local pond to swim in is okay, but what else can we do with it? Keep in mind, Niagara Falls, New York, the city, is growing uh, growing at this time. So they say, okay, we're going to turn this into the town dump. We got a lot of people, which means there's a lot of trash. We're going to put the trash here. Just regular trash at this point. You know what I mean? Just like... As far as we know. As far as we know, <laughs> food scraps. And, and really, our guess here is based on the technology at the time. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's why we can say, you know, just normal trash, uh, because we live in the era of incredibly dangerous trash. <laughs> so, yeah, man, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's this uh, there, there's this garbage mountain here in Atlanta um, off of Moreland. You can see it literally from, you know, like a mile away. Uh, and it's where they keep the recycling. But yet it never seems to get smaller. <laughs> And if you look at it, it's like they clear a path to the top so these dozers can go up there and just dump stuff on there. And I just don't buy that it's all recycling. Just Anyway, that's a story for another day. I like the but landfills. Guessing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Landfills are a hell of a thing. It's like someone was just like some brilliant fellow was just like, hey, what if we just put all our trashes in a hole in the ground and forget about it? That'd mm-hmm. be cool, right? No like we did there. with Grandpa, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, so this is a... Uh, this is, uh, yeah, sorry. But the, like you, you guys are pointing out a, a really important thing, the idea of something being out of sight, out of mind. And that is a huge part of this conspiracy. So they're, they're using it as the town junk heap for a while, landfill. And they do this for about two decades. In the late 1940s, this is where the hooker comes into play. Hooker Chemical Company. That's right. We're not, we're, we're sex positive on this show. We're never going to call sex workers uh, those kind of terms. There is an actual hooker chemical company and they came to town and they said, uh, let's make a deal. 
Yeah. Oh, and a deal they did make. By the way, this is the second Elon I've ever come across who is a founder of a company. Correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but the founder of the Hooker Chemical Company was Elon Hooker. And mm. found, he founded it in that area in Niagara, like on the shores of the Niagara River, according to Politico.com, in 1905. Mm. And a lot of the, this company is active in a lot of uh, chlorination technologies. Mm-hmm. So they're working with various chemicals that definitely have needful industrial uses, but oh, yeah. are not super good. Well, this was the era of that, right? Where it's like, ooh, magical chemical that does a, a, a dirty job. Let's just throw it on everything and <laughs> throw what? caution to the yeah. wind. And what then can? find out a decade later that it gave everyone cancer. What can is best is not do, folks. Yeah, this is where our story begins. It's a story almost a century in the making. It remains one of the most disturbing, sadly prescient tales of slow burn disaster in U.S. history. This is a disaster Like the Yellow King, it exists beyond time. It doesn't just exist in the past. It functions as a harbinger, as we'll see. It's a fable, a parable that could be repeated beat for beat through any number of towns in the United States today. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll dive in to some very polluted waters. Here's where it gets crazy. All right, it's the 1950s. Everybody imagine the transatlantic voice. People are doing, you know, weird dances and stuff. Uh, The cars look really nice. Business is good for America, especially post-World War II economic boom. And that means business is good for the town of Niagara Falls. Their population is exploding. It's not the only thing that's exploding. Yeah. Well, it's not really exploding, Inside but inside the love canal. <laughs> exactly. The, the love, uh, the, the, on top, the waters may seem placid, but beneath there is a flurry of activity. Mm-hmm. Mm, Chemical yeah. activity. Yeah. So there's a boom on a couple levels. You got, you know, when you got industry coming in, people spending money, there's going to be a population boom. People want to move there uh, in the 40s and 50s. Because of that, the town was doing very well, and the population expanded to over 100,000 people by uh, 1960, about 102, well, not about exactly 102,394, according to census data from the, uh, from the, from the year. Uh, the Hooker Chemical Company was participating hand over fist in these boom times. They were so successful, in fact, that they had a bit of a problem. I mean, it's a byproduct of a good problem, uh, making lots of money because of selling lots of chemicals but what are we going to do with all this industrial waste hmm yeah so i mean yeah. it's a real thing cuz uh, the you know when these chemical companies were really had their boom in general the chemical companies in the early 1900s up until about this time and then continued forward it, the thought was we'll take all these chemicals we'll make other chemicals and we'll use those you know, to make products. And a lot of those chemicals have byproducts or stuff you can't use afterwards or stuff that's generated from creating a third chemical out of two or more. Right. Um, And so much of it was being generated uh, that they just had to dump it. Just get rid of it. This is still one of those eras of Western history where a lot of companies were, before they threw stuff away, they tried to figure out whether there was some other uh, method of transforming it into a product that could be sold. That's the reason American bacon is different from Canadian bacon or what American, uh, excuse me, what people in the U.S., call bacon is different from what people in Canada and the rest of the world call bacon. Uh, It's also the reason there are things like cream of tartar, right? It's literally stuff scraped off of barrels. That's how I found that. And they sell it in grocery stores across the planet today. So they went through, the, the hooker company went through different iterations of trying to find a use for this waste. Like you said, they couldn't, and they had this surplus And so they came to Niagara Falls, perhaps doing a Monty Burns steeple with their hands, you know. And from 1942 to 1953, at least, this company, with the knowing approval of the local government, used the canal as a chemical waste dump and use it. They used it to great extent. Uh, If you look at it now, you will see that over this time period, they dumped anywhere from 
20 to 22,000 tons of all sorts of chemicals with very little concern for mixing those chemicals or how to treat specific substances. At least 12 of the chemicals somewhere in that 21,000 tons are known carcinogens. And uh, they just popped them in metal barrels. That's the best way to say it. We can walk through like what a containment barrel is, but we don't really need to. Like picture an oil drum. Exactly. And we can at least say that the chemical company did line the entire area, like the bottom of it with a clay that they thought would be protective. They also covered out all those chemicals with clay thinking, oh, this will help. Um, you, c- you can imagine that they thought it would help. And just the last thing uh, from the reporting that we've been going through, only one chemical at the time that they dumped in there was a known carcinogen at the time. The right. others were like, but, yeah. maybe some, maybe this could cause harm. <laughs> Like, it's messed up to think about it that way. Yeah, but still, they knew enough to not try adding dioxin to lemonade or something, right? Like, (laughs) they knew this stuff was bad. uh, And that's, they attempted to, yeah, to to enclose it in kind of a clay shell. Uh, the, The idea being that anything that might leak from those barrels wouldn't get through the clay. But you have to wonder about their motivations here. This is a part uh, that still remains uh, a matter of speculation. So they, when they are done with this landfill, which is now filled with hazardous waste, 16 acres of it, tens of thousands of tons, they sell it, not to the city, but to the Niagara Falls School Board, and they sell it for a dollar with Uh, a caveat. That's fun. So my question, their their caveat is, we are never responsible, by, by giving us this dollar and taking this land, you agree that forever to the end of time we are not responsible for anything that might happen to anyone ever in this area yeah yep this wash, is your problem wash now wash our hands of this whole dirty business <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yep so i want to ask you guys do you think that's just like standard boilerplate legal agreement language at the time do you think they were motivated by some charitable aspect you know to give back to the city can I just say, anytime you see in like film or, or TV or, or what have you, somebody selling somebody something for a dollar as like some sort of like faux legal protection, usually something shady is going on where it's like, quick, give me a dollar. I'll be your lawyer. And that'll give us like, you know, client uh, lawyer privilege all of a sudden. Does that really hold up? Like, he paid me. See, I have this dollar. Mm. <laughs> like, 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 come mm. on. <laughs> that slipping Jimmy stuff. Well, that's right. Can, yeah. Uh, if you give someone a, a car, for instance, it's really common to just say on the on the title that you sold it for a dollar. I don't know. At that point, I don't know if people actually do exchange the dollar. Uh, maybe they do. Uh, but you're right. You're right. It is. It is pretty sus. So <sighs> this town takes this deal and the city goes on very shortly afterwards, to build a school directly over the site. And then they also build housing, again, directly over the site. And during this construction, that kind of lackluster clay enclosure is busted. Uh, There is damage done to the containment site. In in a couple of places, right? In in, a couple, there are at least a number of barrels that are breached at that time. But it's, it's again, kind of seems like a low impact problem. Like a couple of barrels, a couple places where the clay gets breached. And so they put the clay back as well. Mm -hmm. We should say that. But they're kind of, you know, uh, fiddle dee dee. They're in a hurry. And uh, no one really talks about this until the late 1970s, which means for the better part of two decades, all these chemicals, this very, very dangerous mixtape, stayed in the ground, and it slowly began to leach into the environment. And locals, like it wasn't until local investigative journalists and concerned citizens started going door to door in town saying, hi, I think something's up. In, in this neighborhood, uh, do you have, you or any member of your family, you guys feeling anything weird? And the evidence started to add up, at least what they saw as evidence. Uh, people began to think there was something 
something more, something dark and sinister to that old canal. Oh, dude. I mean, this stuff, <laughs> the stuff, the, uh, the fallout, I guess, no pun intended. Well, it's not exactly nuclear, but it's got uh, some slight. Well, exactly. We'll get there. But the um, let's just say the telltale signs were about as spooky as they come. You have gardens and trees withering and dying. This place becoming like a, you know, creepy, macabre wasteland. Bicycle tires um, because of the rubber they were made of and the reactions they're having with these chemicals. In addition to the soles of like little kids shoes started to like melt in into like these, you know, gelatinous, noxious pools. Yeah, cool. Well, because they're they're puddles of chemicals popping up everywhere We're we're getting a little ahead of it right now. We're going to give you all these details here. Um, it, it's 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 really bad. It's really bad. And in. The the thing that really it really I mean this thing is such a tragedy right we're having some fun we're doing our thing we're being lighthearted but for it it's a problem that was ramping up and causing harm unbeknownst to the people who are living on top of that canal because there were a hundred homes that were also built on this land like right on the edges of the land um, and it was going from the 1950s through the 1970s there's problems and health effects that are just again ramping up and nobody knew yeah weird puddles except for hooker basements <laughs> we're we're who had left town by the way ski down mm-hmm. uh weird smells strange pools and basements and things just appearing in the soil and yards City officials initially do kind of a lip service investigation, but they don't really act they don't really put energy into solving the problem. And at this time, you know, obviously decades have passed. So there are new generations of city officials who are coming into play and they may not have the full awareness of this Faustian bargain that was cracked back in the 40s. These surveys are, you know, they're not necessarily methodologically sound at this point because people are self-reporting, right? They're trying to find a correlation And they see patterns of very strange clusters of illness and medical conditions. Epilepsy, asthma, migraines, nephrosis, learning disabilities. Uh, It seems like there are also abnormally high rates of birth defects as well as miscarriages. Not necessarily throughout Niagara Falls, the city overall, but part particularly in the Love Canal neighborhood. And the heroes of this story right now are the journalists and these door-to-door surveyors who are primarily like the driving force behind this, um, this investigation is a group of working class women who live in the neighborhood and they are fighting the power in a very real way. And uh, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be able to tell you the third act of this story, which we'll do after a word from our sponsors. And we've returned. Uh, When we talk about heroes in this story, we want to give a special uh, thank you to then congressional aide Bonnie Casper, uh, as well as the other people who were working against the powers that be to uh, get this acknowledged and to get some sort of solution or closure. Things are bad. The town looks haunted, like Twilight Zone, Tales from the Dark Side, haunted. You would walk in there and you would be like, the land is wrong. And it really was. (laughs) Uh, The soil is sour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You bury your own. Uh, Here's what happened. There were a lot of wet winters in the 1970s. And because of this excess water, the water table rose and all those chemicals started to leach at an even faster rate. Uh, They were going through uh, a sewer system that drained into nearby creeks. So the water is getting poisoned. It's going into basements. It's going into yards. It goes into the playground of that elementary school built directly over the canal. And the people who are raising their hand about this are dismissed initially as a bunch of hysterical housewives. They're portrayed as like busybodies who have too much time on their hands until other investigations begin. 
Well, think about it. you're talking about 25 years of that process that been described with, with, you know, wet winters, cold temperatures, rising water table, all of that occurring. And to the point where you are seeing the residents there are seeing these barrels like breach out from that clay. Like it's hard to overestimate how insane that probably felt to be a homeowner and to have you just be sending your child to school in this place where this is occurring, where it's uh, what is the toxic Avenger? No, what's it? What is it? Who's the um, there's some superhero or comic where it was a, a dude that was made out of toxic waste. Yeah, toxic Avenger. Toxic Avenger. Okay. From trauma. Right. Yeah. Th- this is what it feels like to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like a, it's satirical sounding. You know what I mean? This is the kind of stuff you think happens in places with like zero oversight, where it's just business first, free for all. And now that I'm saying that out loud, that sounds a hell of a lot like what America is, even though there's <laughs> a semblance of oversight. But again, we have to remember this is just in the nascent days of the EPA. And a lot of, you know, stuff was still not known. And there was not nearly as much oversight and uh, attention paid to the details. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that we're still dealing with today in terms of these super fun sites and cleanup projects that last decades, if not forever, started in those days. It's a good point. I mean, there were a lot of environmental laws before the EPA, but they were often ineffective. They were kind of built to be toothless. Uh, now, th- this results in things like intergenerational genetic chromosomal damage. The consequences are real. This cover-up d- does have um, more to it than just selling land for a dollar. And just on the birth effects tip that you were talking about, yeah. Ben, uh, there was reporting at the time where there were five known cases of birth defects. And the way it was originally reported was often, you know, there are only five cases of birth defects. Mm-hmm. But there are local residents, and particularly the father of one child who was born with some, se- some birth defect, were just... It reiterating, there are only 270 something people that live in this area. And there are five families who have, or, you know, five instances within those 270 people, which if you think about the rate of birth effects, then what that really means, just how horrifying this is. Yeah. If you think of it in percentage, right? Yeah. This is a, this is a very, very disturbing ratio. It hits the national sphere In 1978, uh, this is where then-President Jimmy Carter catches wind of what's going on. I've got here the very first paragraph of the New York Times expose from the front page on August 1st, 1978. 25 years after the Hooker Chemical Company stopped using the Love Canal here as an industrial dump, 82 different compounds, 11 of them suspected carcinogens, have been percolating upward through the soil, their drum containers rotting and leaching their contents into the backyards and basements of 100 homes and a public school built on the banks of the canal. Yeah, and that's not hyperbole. There were photographs of the time where you would see, you know, corroded, decayed metal drums popping through the soil in people's backyards. This is super bad. And I don't mean the comedy film, which was good. Honestly, uh, bears of rewatch. They called boobs warlocks, which is still like one of the coolest lines Jonah Hill ever did. Anyhow. I mean, there's, we're having some levity, but it's interesting that, It's interesting that we're naming so many works of fiction like Captain Planet, Toxic Avenger, stuff like that. It's based on this story. This story inspired these things, this cover up. And there's a journalist we should shout out, Eckhart C. Beck. Uh, He wrote an article in the EPA Journal in 1979, and it's his account of visiting Niagara Falls at this time, speaking with residents, and it's harrowing. He talks about the trees and gardens all over the neighborhood have turning black and dying. He goes by a swimming pool that has been entirely popped out of its foundation, and now it is afloat on a sea of chemicals from the ground. The pool is in a pool, is what happened, not to be too exhibit about it. Yeah, and, and you know, when that's being reported by a federal entity like that, People take notice. The Carter administration starts paying attention and they decide, you know, everybody collectively there who's in charge decides, well, okay, we need we should probably get the humans out of here. So they begin relocating people. And when they initially start it, they begin moving uh, pregnant women and children first. 
because again, they're, they continue to show that the birth defects and the problems that are occurring start at a very, very young age, both within the children and within the mothers who are carrying those children. So it was like a, you know, lifeboat on the Titanic situation. You got the priority ones that get to go and the rest of them are just kind of like listening to the orchestra play on the deck of a sinking ship. Um, they didn't see it that way because they believe the government that 700 families uh, were not of sufficient risk to warrant this expense. Uh, we'll get to that part in a minute. Um, but the testing showed uh, that was conducted by the NYS Department of Health that toxic substances were actually leaching into to their homes. So I don't know. I don't know how much more at risk you can get than that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I know on a large scale operation like this, you kind of have to have certain priorities, but it sounds to me just like the government nickel and diming, you know, a, a very dangerous situation. Uh, but Carter did relent and declared an additional, a second state of emergency. But it wasn't until 1981 um, after local activists just, you know, continued to bang the drum. Uh, and eventually the remaining families were located at a cost of $17 million all in, um, which with inflation today would be about $54 million, which is no small chunk of change. But my question is, is the chemical company on the hook for any of this or does that take no. years and years of class action lawsuits for any of that to come to fruition? There's no hook for the hooker because of that right. legal transaction they made. Oh, that dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was going to come back a, to haunt him. A dollar and yeah. one caveat. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> them, I mean, the, the people, the, the school, not the company. You know, they, they right. were playing the long game there. Right. Spoiler alert. No one goes to jail. Let's talk a little bit about, it, it, you know, the, that rarely happens. It, it would be very rare for, um, you know, the head of a company responsible for these activities to see the inside of a prison unless they were messing with the money. Shout out Black Monday Murders. Please read it if you haven't. So mm. the canal then gets capped again. It's fenced off. The buildings around it are torn down. Let no stone stand on another. And there's this long series of legal processes. Eventually, uh, the first thing that happens legally is that 1,300 people who used to live in Love Canal at some point agree to a $20 million settlement with the successor of the Hooker Chemical Company, a place called Occidental Chemical Corporation, which took over Hooker in the 1960s. And they also settle with the city of Niagara Falls, New York. The cleanup continues. We're talking 30 years of just trying to make this less worse. New York State in the 90s says, okay, we're done. Some parts of the canal are safe to live in again. They renamed the area. It's now Black Creek Village, or that's the first name they went with. And they started auctioning off houses there. But the legal processes continue because the contamination is still there. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, uh, years later in 94, 1994, uh, same chemical company, previously Hooker, now Occidental, they agreed to pay $98 million to New York State as a, way of con uh, as a way of making up for the problems that their dumping created, right? So $98 million. New York gets to, to begin cleaning the place up. And the next year in 95, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, now we're going to, now we're going to settle with the feds, the federal boys uh, for the same actions that we took. And this time it'll be $129 million. So that $1 price tag that they, you know, sold that thing for is looking not so great at this point. Yeah, that's the, that's the kicker. These stories continue after the headlines are gone. You know what I mean? And in some ways, there's a happy ending, right? Because justice was done, but no, no amount of money can reverse these medical conditions, right? And uh, no amount of money can give people that part of their lives back. But there's something bigger about the Love Canal. There's There's a reason that we find this an illuminating conspiracy. It is a parable. That's what we, you could see it as that. That's what we, how we introduced it in the beginning. But it's not a parable just about uh, one company 
in a small town in, in New York State. It's about the long-term dangers at play here, both with chemical waste and corporate cover-ups. This became a, a, a rallying point for a lot of people. It symbolized the looming environmental disaster represented by untold numbers of toxic waste sites across the United States. And you can see that legislators and activists have cited Love Canal when they're trying to deal with problems like this in their own neck of the woods. Uh, it, It actually, this situation, the fallout from that, or the aftermath, I should say, is one of the big driving forces behind the 1980 Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act which the street name for that is Superfund. Uh, and Superfund sites are essentially Uncle Sam saying, whew, this is bad. We, something must be done, right? And, uh, you know, we've got, I think we've got experience with Superfund sites. No, I think you reported on some back in the day, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. When I was at GPB at, or Georgia Public Broadcasting, my beat was the nuclear industry because I was really close to Plant Vogel um, and the Savannah River site, which is considered a Superfund site. But we always kind of joked around in the newsroom that it's that, that term just makes it sound like a playground or something. It's a Superfund site. You know, let's go hang out there and, uh, you know, do well, the let, seesaw. Let's talk about... Let's talk about something we haven't mentioned with this site yet. And that is this dumping site may have also been, at least in some way, radioactive because the U.S. Army in that time period between the 19 uh, or in the 1940s, right before and probably during the time that Hooker Chemical Company owned the area, uh, the U.S. Army was dumping chemicals and waste from the Manhattan Project, from from the United States' efforts to build nuclear weapons, it was it's known and it's reported on in several places here throughout this story that the U.S. Army was actively dumping stuff there. So who knows what else is under was underneath there that we just will never know. Right, and the thing is, during the Manhattan Project, the contents of that dumping would have been a matter of national security. Exactly. So it wouldn't really have been reported. But if you want to learn more about super funds, uh, I would recommend checking out Stuff You Should Know. They've got a great episode on this. It's one of their older ones. Uh, it holds up. I think that's a, a great entry point there. This cover up also helped give birth to a related series of conspiracies, the militant environmental movements in the U.S. and abroad. If you want to learn more about that, check out our earlier episode on the so-called eco-terrorist. That is a loaded term, so let's just be clear about that. And where we end here is this. You have to wonder what else is out there. As we record today, it is statistically certain that there are more love canals somewhere in the United States. They're improperly maintained or they've been neglected. They may have been compromised. They may have been completely abandoned. And they may be largely forgotten by the folks who are living in those sites today. This is something that's going to hit home for a lot of people, unfortunately. You can learn more about Love Canal in the book Paradise Falls, written by a journalist named Keith O'Brien. He focuses on the 1976 to 1980 period. So it's very, very specific focus. But he he builds a case for problems to come in the future. Right now, You know, we can say this cover up has been proven. People tried to make it right, but read your local history, check that water in your basement, be safe. Let us know what you think. Is there is there a story like this that's being underreported where you live in the US or abroad? Please be aware if your child comes home with melted shoes. My God. And just to continue calling out Keith O'Brien as an awesome person. He also wrote an article for Politico that you can read right now. It's titled how a determined congressional aid helped break open the biggest environmental scandal in U S history worth your time. Yes. And while you're online, if you have a story like this from your neck of the global woods, we'd love to hear from you. We try to be easy to find. That's right. You can find us online where we have a Facebook group called here's where it gets crazy. Check that one out for sure. For 
memory galore uh, and good conversation with good folks about the episodes uh, on this very show. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter and YouTube uh, under the handle Conspiracy Stuff on Instagram where Conspiracy Stuff Show. Yes. And if you liked this story, a historical version of something terrible happening when a private corporation and the government, you know, work together and mess something up, you you might like our book, Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. You can pre-order it right now. All the places you can pre-order it. Comes out in October, but if you pre-order now, you'll get it then. And you'll know that it's coming, so it'll be exciting. You get it. <laughs> and uh, and then Illumination Global Unlimited uh, will renew our blood contract for another seven years. I thought those were for That's life. The works. Mm-hmm. Even the afterlife. Oh, yeah. Wait, did you not? You just signed it when they gave it to you? Yeah, Dude, man. You got to negotiate. I, no, I just, <laughs> I'm a blind signer. I just They just had such nice suits. They do have very nice. I will say that. I say what you will about them. They have nice suits. Uh, Giant eyeball shaped heads, which is a little weird with the steepled (laughs) fingers, you know? I just thought Uh, they they looked kind of interesting. I'll sign anything for eyeball guys. No comments. But if you have a comment and you don't like social media, there is another way to get in contact with us. We have a phone number. Just uh, pick up pick up your telephonic device. Hit us up at 1-833-STD-WYTK. You'll hear a hopefully familiar voice. You'll hear a beep, let you know you're in the right place. You've got three minutes. Those three minutes are yours. Go wild. Go nuts. It is, you know, treat it like the landfill for your crazy ideas. Three minutes worth. And uh, let us know what's on your mind. Give yourself a cool nickname. Also, second most important thing, give us, per- let us know if we have permission to use your name and or voice on air. Most important thing, don't edit yourself. Don't feel like, uh, you know, I have a 10 minute story, but I only have three minutes to talk. You have all the time in the world. You can send us a good old-fashioned email. We love those because they come with links. You can send pictures. Take us to the entrance of that rabbit hole. We read every single email we get where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.